would like to uh, introduce this guy, Hashim. You guys have seen him for a while. He plays drums and bass and everything else. But he is a true worshiper. He's going to talk to you about his heart for worship this morning and tell you how to get closer to God and how to get more of God in your life. Let's hear it for Hashim. Thanks. Oh, man. You're like the best pastor in America. Isn't that it's insane? I love it. All right, so I feel like after we always have the worship set and after offering all that, I feel like the vibe goes down super hard. And I'm like, it's like, like super mellow. So it's gonna be, this is either going to be really awesome or super lame. I want to start the wave from this side of the room to the other side of the room. So go. So I'm going to start with you, Kristen. Re okay, everybody's ready. Go. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> yeah. I got a water bottle, too. You guys are awesome. Thank you for that. Keep, we're talking about celebration. So if we're going to talk about celebration, we have to stay hype. And you can tell that I do youth ministry. So today we're going to be talking about mastering the atmosphere of worship. So for us to start to master the atmosphere, we just have to first understand the thing we're trying to master. So what is worship? So I went on Google, like everybody does, and looked up the word. And Google tells me it's the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity, God. So the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. So all throughout the Bible, you see this, and it's super obvious. You see people singing, shouting, writing songs, the whole entire book of Psalms. Is it? Exactly. So, but is that everything? Is worship simply karaoke Sunday with the DFC band? But then, but then we also we have to acknowledge something else, the idea of idolatry, which is taking the worship that is meant for God and placing it on anything else. In the U.S., it's very easy to do that, um, to do this thing that God has said is so important that he made it his first commandment. So we worship our hobbies and put them before the things God has asked us to do. We worship our jobs and we put them before the things God has asked us to do. We worship our families, spouses, children, even ourselves, and put them before the things that God has asked us to do. And sometimes even before God himself. And I don't want to get too far off topic today. We're talking about mastering the atmosphere of worship. But to master the atmosphere of worship in our lives, we must first acknowledge this about ourselves and about the culture, about the culture in which we live so that we don't get caught in the trap of worshiping anything besides the one who deserves it. So to worship God is to master the atmosphere. If you want to see more of God in your life, improve your level of worship. If you want to see more of God in your life, you have to, first, like Pastor Chuck was saying, take that first step and level up. If you look back and you see Kelly and you're like, I need to level up, I need to bring, and then you bring it up and then all of a sudden you see everything around you changes. And sometimes everything around you doesn't change. Sometimes it's just your heart and the way you perceive the things around you change. But to master the atmosphere of worship, you have to take that first step. So how do we master the atmosphere of worship? You need to celebrate the vision, celebrate your sacrifice, and celebrate the journey. When you're able to do this, worship will become every will be everywhere that you are. So celebrate the vision. So do you want to see more of God's plan in your life? Well, yeah, you're here. Christ understood that if we can't see, if we can't see it, we can't make it. So, which is why Christ came. He came so we can have sight. He came so we can see it, so we can have vision. So celebrate that. Acknowledge God. Say thank you, God, for the vision that you've given me. Thank you for being the life source for me. So in Matthew 4, 11 and 12, it says, if I can find it, oh, Mark 4, 11 and 12. I went to the wrong spot, but now I'm here. 11 and 12. So, um, sorry. So Jesus told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. He, he said if they could simply understand, if they could simply see, if they, even, if they just had vision, they could be saved. You guys want more of God in your life, you need to have vision. You need to celebrate the vision that God's already given you. Celebrate the sight that he's given you to be able to move forward and be able to worship him and be able to understand his ways over your ways. And 
this, this is, again, off topic, but isn't it weird when Jesus quotes something? This is from um, Isaiah 6. What he just said is from Isaiah 6. Isn't it weird when Jesus quotes what God said in the Old Testament? Because he was kind of there for it. Like, he, he was the one saying it. So I, I was, I'm like, that's something I was just thinking about last time. Like, it's weird when Jesus, like, quotes himself for, like, 400 years in the past. Really random. I'm sorry. <laughs> just interesting. My late night thoughts. So God wants us to have understanding by worship. Um, by worship. Oh, ah! God wants us to have understanding. By worship, God, we, by worshiping God, we are given just that and so much more. Here's the vision for worship in Romans 1 and 2. Um, which I have memorized, but I'm going to look it up anyway, so I'll make sure I say it right. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in full view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God is, what what, God, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's the vision for worship, to offer your life as a sacrifice, to offer yourself up, to take that first step, to raise your hands a little higher, to scream a little bit louder, and say, I'm offering everything that I am for you. So now we get to the concept of celebrating your sacrifice. Because worship isn't just the song that we sing. It's what, it's what you do. It's something you do. It's who you are. It's our everyday lives. So in Ephesians 3, 16 through 18, oh, man. Yeah. Um, it, is, it talks about this concept of when this becomes your life. So when Ephesians 16 through 18, I pray that, um, I pray that out of his, his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and deep his love is for us. Christ's love for us. Christ's love is for us. Because when you, when you grab a hold of that, when you grab a hold of this this ridiculous, unconditional, powerful love, you can't do anything but worship with your life. You can't do anything besides give honor to the king who deserves honor. Because we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, right? We are citizens of heaven now. Now we've chosen this life with Christ. We've, we've left our American life. We've, we've left that life of adultery, of putting our, our family before God, of putting our jobs before God, before, of doing anything that we see in our culture. Which, is so, which can so easily entangle us, it can so easily influence what we have to say and what we have to do and how we do things, we're letting go of that and saying, no, I'm a citizen of heaven first. And I'm choosing to live my life as a sacrifice. And let's celebrate, let's celebrate that sacrifice because it's amazing. It's an amazing life that we're choosing. It's an amazing a life full of adventure. We just talked about adventure for like three months. It was amazing. And God gave us that. We have to celebrate that sacrifice that we get to have. And then how you get there is through love. So in 1 John 4, 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And the, the way that we, the only way we're able to actually have this sacrifice is if we allow God to reside where he belongs, to sit on the throne that he belongs to sit, that he needs to sit on, which is our heart. And if we love we can do that. Outside of that, it's impossible. It's, an, it's impossible for us to love. It's impossible for us to give this perfect sacrifice to God if we're not living this life of love. We're not choosing to allow him sit on the throne of our heart. So 1 Corinthians 4, 13. Well, actually, let's, let's stop and pray really quick because I'm speaking a lot of verse. Like, I use so much Bible, and I don't want it just, like, to leave us. So God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's strong. Thank you that it's powerful. Thank you that in this moment, our hearts and our minds are being opened up to your word. Let us not, let it just pass over our heads and just fly on by, but let us, let it just drop straight down into our souls like a nuclear bomb, like Hiroshima. Let us be covered in your love, be covered in your scripture, because I'm speaking so much scripture, I, don't, I really don't want it to be lost. So 1 Corinthians 
13, 4. I don't think I gave it to Mike, so don't even, don't even worry about that. If you have your Bibles, pull them out. It's going to be amazing. 1 Corinthians 13, love, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That is literally impossible for any one of us to do all the time. Literally impossible. Outside of allowing God to set himself up right where he belongs. If he's not living in you, then you can't do that. If he's not living in you, you will be influenced by the culture that's around you, and you will fail God, period. But if we celebrate the sacrifice of allowing the Holy Spirit to live in our life, celebrate the sacrifice of choosing love over our own intentions, then out of nowhere, that comes to life, comes to life in us. It will, like, there's no other way for us to live besides that way when we choose to allow Christ to come inside of us and just to be a part of us and to set himself up on the throne of our heart. So give honor to God. That's simple. Give honor to God through your worship. You're mastering the atmosphere of your worship through love. This is an everyday thing. Like I said, it's not just about the songs. The songs are amazing. I love the songs. I'm a musician. You can see that. But when you master the atmosphere of your worship on a regular basis in your lifestyle and the way that you treat your coworkers and the way you treat your children, your parents, then out of nowhere, when you get here, you can't do anything but scream at the top of your lungs. You can't do anything but jump as high as you can and you feel like you're going like, to punch a hole through the ceiling. You can't do anything but that when your lifestyle becomes worship instead of just your words being worship. So now let's celebrate the journey because it's very much that. We talked about, again, we talked about adventure. That was the journey. We're talking about that again today. So celebrate that journey. It's time to celebrate the excitement that's on the way. So when you choose worship, there's this sudden rush of adrenaline that hits you. You're like, whoa, you just get pumped. Like your veins start popping out and like your voice becomes like the voices of angels out of nowhere. Like I could never sing. But when you, when you celebrate the journey, you, you just know that excitement's on the way. You're just sitting in anticipation all the time, just knowing there's about to be something amazing hits you like out of nowhere. And you're going to love it. Trust me, because I've been there and that's why I do what I do now. So in Romans 12, we're going to go back to Romans 12, but this time we're going to go beyond that in 4 through 8. This is the journey. The journey is figuring out your gifts. So just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many from one body, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man has the gift of prophecy, of prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And you, through this, you see that there's a, a wide spectrum of anything that can be considered worship. That's all worship. Working through your spiritual gifts is always worship. It's everything from giving generously to showing mercy. Those are all considered acts of worship. Those are all sp considered spiritual gifts that you can do through Christ. And it was funny because Greg was talking about this morning in our, in our morning prayer as a worship team. And I was like, wow, that's so, that's so true. That worship goes so far beyond just the music. It goes into our everyday lives where we give something, where we give our time, where we serve a little kid and tie their shoes at the front door, where we just show mercy when somebody does something wrong to us. These are all amazing acts of worship. And through your intentional act of worship, through sacrificing your whole self, that you are also given the purpose, which is revealed through your gifts. And that using those gifts for the kingdom is always considered worship. Isn't, I just think that's so amazing. I, 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 just, I celebrate that in my own life because God, he started revealing my spiritual gifts very early on. Like I got baptized and soon, soon after I started like seeing this gift of giving in me, like out of nowhere. And I didn't grow up in a rich family or anything, just, but I felt the, this need, this desire to always give. 
I remember the first time I ever gave, like I, I think it was my birthday, and I got $5 for my birthday, and I came to church, and I put the $5 in the offering plate. I was like so, I was amped. I was so happy that after, afterwards, I went up to my mom, and my mom's friends were like, I gave $5 in the offering plate. I, I was like this tall, like Landon height at least, maybe shorter. And I was like so happy that I had given $5. And that, that's a spiritual gift. That's something that God imparted on me even that age. So it doesn't even matter how old you are, how young you are. God is putting this heart of worship in every single one of us in all these different kinds of ways. And even to this day, like, I'm not rich or anything, but I just, I love being able to give. Even when I have, like, no money, I'm like, I, I need to, what's in my pockets? I remember one time, I was, um, I was super broke. I was doing a discipleship program out in Chicago. And I was really bummed out because the speaker was like, all right, guys, it's time for you to dig deep, dig deep. And it's, we're going we're to give to this, this, like, probably some world thing, like, helping out orphans in Africa, which is amazing. I'm not, like, making fun of that, but it's probably some, some sort of thing like that. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm super broke. I literally have nothing. I can't even give the shirt off my back. I don't, I don't have anything. And my, I reached into my pocket. Do I, do I really have that in my pocket? No, I don't. I have two quarters. And at the time, I've gotten super rich since then. I, only had, I literally had two pennies. And God, he, he, revealed, he has reminded me of that idea of like, oh, the person who just gives those two pennies is greater than the one who was boasting giving the $3 million. Not saying anybody did that, but I'm just saying that in that moment, he reminded me that giving isn't just so much about the dollar amount, whether you have a whole lot, but just giving what you have. It's super ironic that I had two quarters in my pocket. That's amazing. But God just, like, he exposed this huge spiritual idea, and it, honestly, it put, my, it put my level of worship through the roof. Like, after that worship service, I was, like, just, rock, just going, I was charged up. It was amazing. And I'm sorry for getting off the topic, but like, I just I want to give you personal stories of my spiritual gifts and how how it can go something as big as giving five dollars to as little as an adult giving two pennies. It, just when you go home today, just start praying about that. Start praying about what are my spiritual gifts. What can how can I go deeper into my lifestyle of worship on a day to day basis? Whether that's serving, um, taking out the trash when you know it's not your job or washing the dishes even though your wife always does it, or putting your shoes back where they belong. It, it can really just be as simple as those kinds of things, just loving people beyond yourself. And if you don't have a clue, just spiritual, okay, I just said that, sorry. But you'll become a powerhouse worshiper in the kingdom of God. Just start by doing another thing, which is humbling yourself. There's so many ways, I, I just love worship. It's such a huge part of my life that I just can't let go of it. Because I, I just know that when I worship, I become more like Christ. And when I become more like Christ, I just want to do more for the world. I want to do more for the people around me. But in Matthew 23, 8 through 12, Christ gives us another huge spiritual idea when it comes to worship and how we should worship. And, okay, 23, 8 through 12, I'm just going to go for it. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are... And you are all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor, do you have, no, uh, nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be, will be your servant, for whoever exalts him, whoever, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Um, a fun phrase that my friends and I have or have had is humble or be humbled. So we was like, we'd mess with each other and like we'd start like getting out of control and just say, yeah, man, I'm the, I'm the best, I'm the best. Someone would just like do something ridiculous, like pull our pants down or I don't know, put a piece of pie in our face, like something really random. Be like, humble, be humble or be humbled. And it's like, dang, you got me. Oh, but Jesus, Jesus is saying that be humble or be humbled. And he's asked, and that's, that's part, that's another spiritual act of worship. It's humility, servanthood. The leaders should be the, the, be the greatest servants. That's one thing I just love about Pastor Chuck. He's one of the greatest servant-hearted people that I've ever met. And he, that means he's, he's just, this verse right here is him. So if you want to understand what humility, what being a good leader looks like, look to your pastors. That's amazing. I'm so glad to be a part of this community and be a part of this ministry because of that. And worship does another thing. Worship exposes our weaknesses. Because 
as we're on this journey to figure out what our gifts are, we realize that we're weak in some areas. As we're on this journey to love people, we fail, and we realize how weak we are at loving. And when we expose our weaknesses, we become transparent, and God wants to see us transparent. He doesn't want us to have walls built up around us where we're saying, we're not going to go any further, and you can't look in, we, but really they're just glass walls, and we're just holding ourselves back. But God, God wants us to worship more and worship stronger because it exposes our weaknesses. It tears down, tears down the walls in our life and allows us to grow. So be transparent with your worship. And I think that's a huge thing when we're singing songs because sometimes we're like, I'm, I'm the worst singer. I don't want to talk about it. I'm the best singer. And I don't have any biceps, so I'm just going to like keep my arms behind my back. And we think like that sometimes. We get caught in that mindset of, oh, do I look cool? Do I, is, do I sound great? What? And when we do that, we're not allowing our weaknesses to be exposed through worship. We're instead hindering our growth because we're putting these glass walls, or we're putting these glass walls around ourselves that aren't allowing us to grow. Worship breaks through all those walls. Worship is transparent. So celebrate your sight. Celebrate your hearing. God wants us to see the way that he sees. He wants us to hear what he is saying. So when we worship the one true God, he, we then recalibrate our perception. When we worship God, we recalibrate our perception. Um, right now my car is like, need, it needs some recalibration. <laughs> but so the wheels are kind of like a little bit off and this, the brakes, I need to get new brakes. Like this little, little random stuff, like stuff that's not really, really big. But just in the same way that we recalibrate our cars when there's a little bit off, we come into a worship setting like on a Sunday and us just worshiping strong, worshiping hard recalibrates us. It, it puts us back in line, puts us back on the straight and narrow path that God has made for, that Christ has set and is walking ahead of us and walking with us at the same time. It's a crazy concept, but he's doing it. And it sets us back on that path and it, it strengthens us. Worship strengthens us. In the same way that it exposes our weakness, it allows us to become strong. So when we go to the gym, it does the same thing. When we go to the gym, it exposes our weakness super hard. Like, you can see, I'm a, I'm a pretty, like, not, I'm like an athletic build, but I'm still pretty skinny. If you put me underneath the bench, it's been like a few months I've worked out. It's going to be like this. I'm like, it, I expose my weakness when I'm struggling. But as time goes on, as I continue to press in and just get consistent with my life of working out at the gym, all of a sudden, I get stronger. My weakness was exposed initially, but now I'm getting stronger and stronger in it. Soon I'm confident in it. Soon I'm just doing it, and it's a regular part of my life, and I'm healthy, and I'm strong, I'm ath athletic, and I'm a big build. You, I'll come up here like three months from now if I get into it, and my biceps are going to be like four, 49 inches. I don't know how big biceps are, but they're going to be huge. And I'm not going to skip leg day either, so I'm going to have to buy new pants. And that's the way your worship life should be. We're just consistently pressing into it. Every morning, you're, you're reading your Bible. Every morning, you're, you're hugging your children. Every morning, you're just saying, I'm going to choose to sacrifice my will over God's will. I'm going to choose to put other people before me, even if that means that I, I have to step, step back and let someone else get the spotlight. It's not easy. Christ never said it was going to be easy. But if we continually do that, we become more like Christ, and we become more like the citizens of heaven that we are become more like the citizens of heaven that we actually are. So I just want to do something different. Um, I, I want to end with the Lord's Prayer. Is that okay with you guys? Do you guys know that? I feel like you guys know that. So Christ was teaching us how to pray, and I feel like if we start praying these things and start believing it, if we start speaking it, perceiving it, and believing it, it will set our life up for an atmosphere of worship. So I just want to, is it okay if we just all pray? I feel like most of you guys know it. So if you don't know it, just like mock the other person's next to you, like just... Copy them, not mock them. Copy them. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, amen. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Oh, keep going, keep going. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Wow. So when the worship team gets back up here, I just want you to understand and put God in his rightful place in your heart. I want you to keep your eyes fixed on 
the Christ that is sitting, that is seated on the right hand of God. Because when you, when you set your life up for that in worship, you just, you bring yourself to a new place in life where you're no longer worried about the stresses of this world. You're now mastering the atmosphere of your worship, and then all of a sudden, everything changes. Amen. Now, I have to admit, I have to admit, sometimes I worship God to show off my biceps. And I felt very convicted when you said that. I, I don't want, I, when I worship, I want to do it for him. I don't want to be like, you know, you know. Um, how many of you struggle with your worship with God? How, how many of you feel, I mean, uh, probably most of the hands would go up. I mean, some of you know me for a lot of my life. I mean, I've always been, at one time, you would have defined me by worship. You would have said, Nobody worships like Chuck does. But in recent years, I've struggled with that. I've struggled. When you serve God for 26 years, it's so easy to fall into ruts. It's so easy, you know, you've sung so much. You've listened to worship so many times. Uh, there's times, I, you know, I'd listen to people like Jason Upton. Emily walked into the office and she says, no wonder you're dealing with depression. Turn on something happy. Now, uh, so, some, some of it's just the tempo is so low, and you just got to turn on something that jacks you up. And, but, you know, um, I've been rediscovering worship in my own life, and that's why I, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today, because I, I really believe you become the object of your worship. In Romans chapter 1, um, I was going to read it to you, Romans 1. And I think what Hashim is talking about today is that if you want to be good at worship, it has to go into every part of your life. You're not just going to come in here Sunday and be like, I'm going to worship. And I love the points that he was making there. It's, it's got to go deep into your life. It's much more than a song you sing. It's your lifestyle. And that's what a great point. Um, this verse in Romans says uh, that when the people knew God, they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Do you feel like sometimes your life gets so busy you forget to worship or give God thanks? Then, then be careful of that because you could end up like the people that Romans 1 is talking about. It says they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. When you get away from worshiping God, when you get away from having Him in your life every day, when you start to rely on the Sunday morning service for like all of your spiritual food and you have nothing on Monday then you're in danger. You're, you start to get confused spiritually and physically. You start to get, uh, mentally, you start to get confused and dark. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like, uh, more like, uh, like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they became vile and degraded themselves into each other's bodies. And they traded the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator himself who is worthy of praise. Man, powerful verses right there. And I'm kind of like on this hunt in my own life to just get closer in my worship. And I'd love for you to join me in that journey. And I'd love to encourage you to make God bigger in your life. Will you follow that lead this week? To make God bigger in your life. I mean, maybe, maybe just you just go get a new worship album maybe you just go to iTunes and just download something new and just start listening to it a song until you feel it and then just close your eyes and get on your knees before your day starts there's what I love about our church we have all different kinds of people in here and all of you have different life patterns and routines and, um, but before you start your day get up 15 minutes or a half an hour early and just get on your knees and just start to talk to God. Just start to worship God. I'm not even talking about prayers. I'm talking about, God, I love you so much. You're so amazing. Thank you for this great life you've given me. You know, you can, you can pretty much get everything out in 30 seconds, and then you're stuck with nothing to say. And then you just go, you're awesome. You're great. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for this place I live. God, I just thank you for this and this and this. And God, I just pray today you move in my life and just pray that I would know you more. And see, you start to do that. I just pray I'd know you more. And you just start talking to him. You know, I'm having these problems in my life. I said it in the beginning. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you seek me, you will find me. James 4, 8, draw near and I will draw near. 
These are, this is God saying, if you seek me, you'll find me. He says, draw near and I'll draw near. It's in your court. You have the choice. You can be close to God. Jesus said, wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am. If you gather in his name, he will show up. And so I just encourage you today to focus on God consciously. Make the decision. You know, uh, you have to, you have to, Seek for God when you're not feeling it most of the time. You have to pray to God when you're not feeling it. You know, you're not feeling spiritual. You're not feeling close to God. But you make the decision to reposition yourself to get near Him. You know, if my wife's, you know, sitting at the other end of the room and I want to be close to her, then I'm going to get out of my chair and I'm going to go over there and I'm going to sit next to her. And sometimes it's my gadget that gets in the way. And I'll be right beside of her, but I'm just, you know... Whatever I'm doing, <laughs> Pokemon. I don't even do that anymore. I did it for like a week and I got bored with it. Um, I was just, you know, the motion. But then all of a sudden I noticed she's cool with it because my wife's not one of those wives that's always nagging. Anyway, um, she's not a nagger and I'm not a nagger, but I can tell it bothers her. So then I put the gadget away and I look into her eyes. What am I doing? I'm repositioning myself so that I'm in relationship with her. Are you, are you getting this? And that is what God wants you to do when we talk about master the atmosphere. And so I want us to stand right now and and Father, I just want to pray right now that we would get closer to you in the next seven days in our lives. Um, one of my favorite places to be is in the middle of a good worship song when I've been focused on you through the whole thing. That moment when all of a sudden, I don't know, I get, it's like I get chills because I feel your presence in my life. And there are a lot of people, you know, people would say, we don't, you know, we don't live by chill bumps, we don't live by feelings. And I understand that we live by faith, but man, I sure do love it when you show up. And I just pray in Jesus' name for every person here that God, you would, kickstart worship inside of them. As Hashim was talking about today, God, that they would um, that they would step into a, a lifestyle of worship, God, and that you would start to show up in everything, God, in their vision, in their sacrifices, that you would show up in their journey, in their everyday life, through their gifts, that God would start to be felt and seen in every person in this room. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hid. Then God, if we're going to be that and the world is going to go, look, there's a Christian, then I pray they see the radiance of Christ coming out of us. God, I pray that you would forgive us for being distracted and not spending time with you. And God, we're gonna, not going to condemn ourselves or live in guilt, but we are going to get up and we're going to go for it. We're going to get closer to you, God. And I pray that there will be a move of God in our church this week, a move of God in devotion times, a move of God when people are reading the Bible, when people are praying, when people are talking with one another about you, God, I pray that you would show up just the way Jesus said it, two or three, then boom, God, there you would be. Then people would go, man, I feel like God is like in this conversation, and that you would draw close to them. I pray not just for our church, but for all churches in the area, that God, worship would truly be felt. I pray, God, especially for people who once worshiped you so mightily and have, and have, and have just gotten complacent that God you would awaken worship within them today Father I pray that you would start like a revolution in their soul that God people would get closer and closer and closer and that you would get bigger and bigger and bigger in their lives everyone in this room needs more of you in their lives God there's no question about it and so, Lord, we open our hearts up. We just start to focus on how good you are. Lord, we do it just for a little while, and we start to feel it. And then we go out into this world, and we start to swallow it all up. And I pray every day we would push the schedule back, and that we would make room for you, that we would be spirit-driven people. In Jesus' name. And I pray right now for every person here that you would help them, Father, to rediscover worship in their lives. I pray, God, that you would be supreme in their lives, God, that, that, God, every person would have a true connection with you every day of their lives, that there would be this moment where they connect with you, when, they, when they're eye to eye with you, Jesus, in their lives. 
I pray for husbands and wives to pray together. I pray for families to have that time together as families. I pray for parents to teach their children what it truly means to worship you, Father. God, we want to be like Samuel. God, just bring in a revival of worship through the land, Father. We just thank you for that right now. Would you just raise your hands right now? Don't try to flex. <laughs> but seriously, raise your hands right now. We just raise our hands to you, Father. Let's just sing with the worship team for just a couple minutes before we head out of here. <laughs>